Hello, my name is Mariette DiCristina. I'm the Dean of the College of Communication here at Boston University. I'm really pleased to be introducing the latest in a series of virtual events this spring that we've arranged for you. Many of them are looking at how are we grappling with or looking forward to the future from our current perspective in a, in a, during a global pandemic with coronavirus. Today, our discussion is on the topic of what does sports journalism look like with no sports? Our uh, moderator and discussant is Michael Holly, Associate Professor of the Practice at Com. I'm going to introduce him really quickly and then turn it over to him to lead the discussion. Michael has authored six New York Times bestselling books and spent a dozen years working for three daily newspapers, the Akron Beacon Journal, Boston Globe, and the Chicago Tribune. He was part of the Beacon Journal's Pulitzer Prize winning team in 1994. He's also co-hosted sports and talk radio show in Boston for 13 years and co-hosted studio pre and post game shows in NBC Sports Boston. For questions during the conversation, I'd like to remind us all to please submit them in the Q&A window. And now I'd like to turn it over to Michael to introduce the other speakers. Thanks a million to all of them. Can't wait to hear the conversation. Over to you, Michael. All right, Dean, D. Christina, thanks so much. Uh, we appreciate it and thank you all uh, for joining us here today. We're gonna have a great conversation, a lot of fun. And I promise uh, for those of you who watched uh, ESPN's attempt at broadcasting a horse tournament, uh, we promise it's going to be a lot more entertaining than that, and it's going to be faster than that, too. Why did they spend two hours on it? I don't know. <laughs> so uh, we want to uh, go over a couple of things before we get started, before I introduce uh, these uh, great panelists here. One, uh, if you have any issues, any uh, audio-visual issues uh, today, uh, please call Zoom directly. Yes, blame it on Zoom. Call them directly. I have a number for you, one 888 799 Six, six. Also, uh, this webinar will be recorded and is available to view on the BU Alumni website. And as the Dean mentioned, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, submit those using the Q&A feature uh, that you should see at the bottom of your screen. So let's introduce the panelists today. Uh, first, we have uh, Marissa and Jimmy. Marissa is a COM graduate, uh, COM 2017. Um, she has covered a number of sports, uh, covered the Boston Bruins for the Herald, also women's hockey and lacrosse. She's been a play-by-play -play announcer for the Boston Pride and Boston Cannons. Uh, she's worked for a range of publications, ESPNW, the Boston Globe, uh, the Newburyport Daily Times. And also uh, we have Michael Felger. Uh, Michael, also a COM graduate, Pride, uh, pride of the class of 92. Uh, Michael is uh, very proudly from Wisconsin, considers himself a cheesehead, even though he's been in Boston since 1988. And somewhere on one bio I read, he said, uh, it's long enough to be considered a Bostonian now. Sorry, Boston. Uh, so you got him. You can't help it. But uh, not only is he a, a comm graduate, uh, he has covered the Patriots. He's covered the Bruins. He even covered the Revolution. Uh, 2005, he started doing a radio show on uh, ESPN Radio. He said, uh, thank you. That show lasted three years. He'd like to thank the seven, view, the seven listeners who were along with him. That's some humility there, Felger, because in 2009, now this is really incredible. I know, I know what I'm talking about here, trust me. 2009, he started doing a show, Felger and Maz. Uh, that show, 11 years later, is a record, I'm not exaggerating, it is a record setting show when it comes to ratings. Uh, I once competed uh, against Felger's show and it, it drove me right to the academy. I mean, I, I couldn't deal with it. So, uh, but no, he does a great job. Uh, Marissa and Michael, welcome. The Thank first you, thing I wanna ask you, everybody wants to know, Felger, I'll start with you. You're doing a four hour radio show every day. There are no sports happening. What gives? Okay, so I think that I'm really only having to fill for 30, call 30% of what, uh, you know, I would have to normally cover for. Because, Mike, as you know, NFL free agency, NFL draft is going to take up three quarters of the show anyway. I mean, it is. Even the first couple rounds of the Bruins and the Celtics, maybe there's a, a big Bruins game or Celtics playoff game the night before that would take up more than 30% of the show if something special happened or something controversial happened. But for the most part, Patriots in the NFL free agency draft 
is taking up three quarters of the show. We still have that. And then you have Tom Brady on top of it. So if, if we didn't have the apocalypse, if the world wasn't ending and Tom Brady was still leaving the Patriots, we'd still be doing 80, 90% of the shows on that topic. So I, I really, you know, we've been very fortunate that the Brady thing happened and that the NFL is the NFL. And so, like, that's how we fill it. And I think the other, instead of talking about a Bruins or Celtics playoff game, what I find interesting, and I don't know if, you know, the, the listeners don't find it as interesting as I do, but I think just talking about what the leagues could look like when they come back is a topic unto itself. I mean, some of these ideas, quarantining in Arizona, taking the whole league and flying them to Florida, you know, empty arenas in Vegas or North Dakota, like all that stuff I find kind of interesting. And that's sort of the formula. And that's what we've been doing now for a month plus. And what you just said there, I've been telling my sports journalism students, actually one of their, their final assignment, uh, final essay uh, is about that exactly. What happens next? What's going to happen? What's going to stay? What's going to go away? Because we know everybody keeps saying, let me get back to normal. Well, you got to get past that thought because now that we've gone through this, the life that you knew before, something is going to change. Even if it changes by 5%, something will change and, and we will go forward with that. Uh, you, I, you may remember, uh, Michael, uh, 2001, you probably were traveling at that time before 9-11 I remember because I am notoriously late, Marissa. I'm notoriously late. So uh, I remember traveling on September 4th, September 5th, 2001. I would run to security. Security was nothing. I just throw the bags through security, run to the gate. 15 minutes before my plane took off, I jump on the plane and there we go. Well, that change, that's not, that world is gone and we're never going to get that back. And so something is going to change going forward. Marissa, I, I imagine for you, from a beat writing perspective, it's a little different. You know, Felger uh, can do a radio show and they can, it can go far afield. But covering hockey, what was it like for you when the league just shut down? What did you do? But just trying to find stories and find things to write about. And there's always stories because there's always people and you can always find different angles. But the difficulty is at the start of all this, the NHL wasn't really making players available. They weren't making coaches available. So it wasn't like every day, okay, we can talk to Bruce Cassidy if you don't have a good story idea you can just use a quote and write around that or something we just didn't have access so it was just trying to come up with anything to put into paper I started writing about water polo about lacrosse about literally anything just to fill the pages because there wasn't only not news there was no access like on a practice day if there was nothing really going on you could just go talk to someone go talk to Carson Kuhlman in the corner and then do some sort of story on that and just nothing like that was available so it became extremely difficult to try to cover a team especially the day-to-day -day aspect because there was just no information out there and no access to figure figure out what anyone was up to until they started doing some zoom calls and even then most of the questions weren't asked a lot of the questions that were asked were these fluff questions coming from PR of like who would you want to hang out with on a deserted island which like none of us were writing about because who cares about that so it, it became extremely difficult to cover a team and find stories every day which is hard to believe when you have a full roster a full history of a team and you just can't find anything to write about with them. I've, I've never seen anything like that. And I'd imagine there's nothing, there's nothing other than the scenario right now that's happening that would create an environment like that. Now, now Marissa, I do want to say, I, 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 love, my, I love my PR brothers and sisters, the, the good ones. But you know, some PR directors get really offended when you, get, when you go outside of them to get phone numbers, to get emails from players, to get their personal information. And w when you realized there was a shutdown, did you go on your own? Did you, did you just check in with players, you know, every now and then just to try to generate story ideas outside uh, of the team's PR department? The Bruins are a tough team to do that with because they pretty much shut that down from the start. I tried to do that back in June around the draft and free agency where I was trying to text a few of the uh, front office people and they didn't really appreciate that all too much. So that's something uh, I've tried to avoid um, as someone who is relatively new to the beat and you don't want to create too much trouble uh, doing that too publicly. But I tried a couple of things. But again, th they're a team where it's tough to do that. So um, it, it's not like um, a team like the Boston Pride, for instance. I was just texting players left and right, and they don't mind anything like that. So that was a lot easier. But uh, I was the Bruins. Those attempts get shut down pretty quickly. And Felger, I, I know you covered the Bruins. And I, I see that look on your face. Now, what would you do in the situation if you're on the beat? How would you handle it? The games are gone. And you gotta fill you gotta fill the space. What do you do? Well, you know, uh, first of all, you know, beat writers like Marissa are invaluable to us. 
right, and I was in Marissa's spot. Marissa, like, uh, Jesus, I'm old. 30 years ago, though, you know, I, from you, I went BU Com. I wrote for the Newburyport Daily News, which was, I think that's the same, I guess they changed the name of the newspaper, but I was a stringer for the Newburyport Daily News, and I covered the Bruins as one of the first beat till they kicked my ass off of there because I called Jeremy Jacobs a thief, which, you know, 30 <laughs> years later, you know, I mean, I, they, they didn't uh, take me off the beat for being wrong. They just took me off the beat because for relations. But uh, let me just say that the, the beat writers are invaluable because, you know, we there on the radio get to write, oh, so Marissa says Tuka Rask is one of the best goalies in the league. One of the best goalies in the league? <laughs> what are you talking about? He's a choker. 617-779-0985. So without the beat writers to pick on, you know, we lose a lot of material too. So that's why, you know, it's sad to hear what happened at the Herald, Marissa, and with your role. And, like, you know, that is, as a former Herald guy, and, you know, being in this town for 32, three years now, well, however long it is, the value of that second newspaper and having those beat writers there is so valuable. And as, you know, as, you know, we, we can do a lot of ragging on the Herald for a lot of different things, but if it, but if it ever goes away, man, that's a different, it's a different landscape and we'll all be worse off for it. So that's a little bit. On the soapbox, you asked me, like, what would I be covering? Like, well, the one thing I'm not interested in that I read a lot of is going back in time. Top 10 best Boston Bruins, top 10 best game. Like, I don't know, that just doesn't do it for me. I would sort of mind the thing that I'm talking about, which is, like, call up the folks in North Dakota. Are you really – is that arena really open? Could you – how many hotels do you have in North Dakota? Can you handle the NHL in North Dakota? You know, they did some reporting up in Manchester, and the – they asked the guys who ran the rink up in Manchester, have you hear about this? And they're like, no, we have no idea what the hell you're talking about. But like, I would just sort of mind that. Like, is it really possible to quarantine an entire league or even a quarter of the league in these podunk places? Or, you know, I, like, again, that's just sort of the angle that I'm interested in, getting back and what it's going to look like. Uh, and that's a good point. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that happens here, uh, we, are, we are always going fast, whether it's, whether it's Michael doing his radio show Okay, you finish at six o'clock and you're not sitting there saying, oh, that was a great show. Your next thought is, what do we do tomorrow? What do we do tomorrow? And the same thing with Marissa, you know, you're covering a, you're covering a game, you got an off day. It's always what's happening next. I think this time, and, and Marissa, I'll, I'll start with you on this. This allows us to slow down a little bit and think about and really dive into some issues that maybe we haven't spent a lot of time on. Now you both, well, Michael, you've mentioned uh, Jeremy Jacobs. I remember that uh, when, you, when you called him a thief in print uh, and, and they took you off that beat. But Jeremy Jacobs is a controversial owner uh, in the National Hockey League, and he was one of the first people. We were saying this uh, before you all came on. He was one of the first people, when the pandemic took place and, and the league started shutting down, some athletes, not just owners, some athletes said, hey, I'm going to donate $100,000 to the part-time employees who really count on us being here, concession people, parking people. I'm going to throw money at them so they don't lose any income. Jeremy Jacobs went in the opposite direction and was laying people off, one of the first people to do it. So that is a reference to him being cheap and, 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 and criminal uh, at times. Okay, look, 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 look. This, is, this, is, this is just for family purposes. Don't be tweeting this stuff, all right? Uh, but Marissa, uh, do you feel, feel like this is a time, is this a time where you can maybe dig into some issues that you know, beat writing, day-to-day -day beat writing doesn't allow you to do? Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to do some stuff like that. It's a lot tougher without a designated platform because not only am I trying to find sourcing on stories like that, but trying to sell them to places too, trying to write them for places, trying to write them for a value because people keep like emailing me write for this blog for free. And I'm like, I would love to write, but I'm not going to do that. Um, so it's kind of tough to, um, th there's a the time now and there's the availability now, but without a platform, it becomes tougher. Um, you mentioned Jeremy Jacobs and all that. I've been trying to cover that TD Garden story a lot. That was um, mainly the Bruins beat at the Herald at the end of it I was writing about that every day and now I'm trying to find somewhere else to cover that story because it's not over yet there's still employees going through a lot um, there's still a lot of details that are going unreported about all that so right now a lot of my focus on reporting is trying to find uh, not only more details about that and report on it but find a platform to show it uh, that and just trying right now to focus on some of those other stories you don't get to tell my last story for the Herald was about Harvard women's water polo and how do athletes that rely on water, how do they train right now without water? So I'm just trying to find stuff like that to write about uh, that people aren't thinking about because uh, in the day-to-day -day sports newscape, there, a lot of people aren't thinking about the vast majority of sports. Um, and those stories are still stories and right now might be the time to tell them. And it just pops into my head, you know, I am kind of curious 
most of these hockey players can't skate. Yep. They're not skating. So that's sort of akin to how does a water polo player train without water? How does an ice hockey player train without ice? And are they sneaking it in there? Tell, don't tell me that these guys have gone 32 days. You know, it's been 32 days, I think, since they shut the leagues down. Since lacing up skates and twirling around a sheet of ice, don't tell me they haven't broken into some building. Or if I'm the Bruins and it makes me a bad person, so be it. I give them a key to the freaking Warrior Ice Arena or something and say, you know, when you're on your own and no one's around, you go skate. Because I, I, I don't know how – it's one thing, uh, you know, I don't know. A skating is so essential to that sport. How do you train to be an ice hockey player without ice? Like that would be a story I would read. Oh, for sure. I, I'm writing about the Boston Pride with this right now where I talked to a player a couple weeks ago of in the off season, you're, tr you're still skating. You're still trying to get that skating work in. So it isn't like a simulation of the off season because you'd still be skating every couple of days or so at least. And now you can't do that at all. And the NHL came out either today or yesterday saying uh, they, they need two or three weeks to repair before they play games again. It seems like it might be more than that if no one's skating at all. I'm going to switch gears here. I saw a story from Ben Volan of the Boston Globe, and he wrote it probably about a week ago, a week and a half ago, where his, his position was, his argument was, hey, no, sport, no traditional sports on TV has really brought out a lot of creativity, and I'm enjoying it. Uh, some of the rehashes of, uh, Mike, as you said, okay, another you know, a game two of a playoff series in the first round where you're not really, you're not really uh, compelled by either team. Is that really interesting to talk about? He said he, he is liking some of the things that he has read and that he has seen. And, and it leads me to this. Um, if, if you are talking to a young journalist and you're trying to say, you got to have a lot of things in your tool bag just in case of emergency like we have right now, what would you focus on? I mean, something's happening right now where, well, Michael, you just can't go on the radio and say, well, hey, guys, it's a pandemic. What do you expect me to talk about? I know you, got, you talked about the 80 to 90%, but what about the 10%? How do you make up for the 10% that is not paint by numbers? Yeah, I, it's, that's really challenging. Again, Mike, I, 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 me, this is just me personally. I am fascinated to see how these leagues get back and how hard they're trying. So any little detail about coming back is how I would try and fill that gap, you know? Uh, and so no one's trying, you know, I, I just, I said, I'd send someone to Vegas to walk the streets of Vegas, and, but no one's traveling. You can't go anywhere. So, like, you know, I, I've, I've got to – that, that's what makes it even more challenging is that you can't leave your house. Uh, but, it, I, again, those are the sort of things that I would really be – I don't know. I'd really be pressing. I'd be pressing that sort of stuff because I think, uh, you know, I'm just worried about what fans want to talk about. And I, I do think fans are interested, Mike, in sort of formats and rules, you know, is the NHL yeah. a 16 team tournament or is it a 24 team tournament? Is it going to be a play in tournament among those bubble teams? Are they going to go best of three or best of five or best of seven or one and done? You know, I, I, I think fans can sort of sink their teeth into that. Like uh, the baseball stuff they're talking about, seven inning games or no mound visits or the electronic strike zone because they're worried about social distancing and they don't want the umpire to be crowded up there behind the catcher, spitting on the catcher. So he's going to stand six feet back and they're going to have an electronic strike zone. Like, I. Like I, like, I would just try and mine as many of those little details as I possibly could. Those little tiny details sometimes are interesting. That, that's good. And, you know, Marissa, I, I think uh, I, I find this from a lot of fans and maybe a lot of players too. You know, in the early, in the early stages when, you know, Rudy Gobert of the Utah Jazz, uh, he, was not, he was not taking it seriously. May, many of you saw the video where he's around and he's putting his hands all on the microphones and he winds up with the coronavirus. And he infects one of his teammates, uh, Donovan Mitchell, and they are still not quite right. They're not talking. They're not back on good terms because Mitchell is very angry with them. So you see what happened. Utah Jazz, that happens. The NBA shuts down. Then the NHL follows and the NCAA follows and Major League Baseball. And so in the early, in the early stages, I feel like in the first few days, people were being very mindful. Hey, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to say that sports matters. But as Michael said, now we're in the, in the 30s. Have you heard from people who, who they just really want sports? They're, they're afraid to say it because they don't want to seem like they're insensitive. They don't want to seem like they're not taking uh, this very serious thing uh, lightly. Have you, have, you, have you thought about that of just, hey, some people just want, they want to talk about what they lost. For example, for the Bruins. The Bruins were on their way to being the top team in the NHL and maybe – getting back to the Stanley Cup final. 
and, and and now they don't have that. You talk to players or fans who are experiencing that, Marissa? Yeah, I mean, it's a delicate balance because you're right. Nobody does want to say the wrong thing. The way I've looked at it and what I've tried to say is it does matter because it affects people's livelihoods. I mean, me included, look, people are losing their jobs because there's no sports. So if people's lives depend on and their livelihoods and making money and surviving ma- like depends on this, then it must matter, right? Um, if team A beats team B, it might not be um, – as important as a pandemic, but it matters enough to keep people having jobs and have food on the table, right? So it does matter and the conversation does matter if nothing else but a distraction or just something positive because you go on Twitter or you uh, look at any social platform these days and it's just like extremely depressing. And I'm not the type of person that's going to sit and watch a game from the 1970s. It's just not like where my interest is or even a game from 2011 that I've already seen or something. But people who want to talk about it like that's fine because everything else is really upsetting right now. So I I think it's good that if people are talking about sports still, it's still a topic that's worthy about talking about. It might not be um, the end of the world compared to literally the end of the world going on right now. But yeah, people do still want to just talk about, hey, wouldn't it be cool if the Bruins were in the playoffs right now? And would they be playing Tampa in the second round? And what would that matchup have looked like if Stamkos came back and all of that? It's um, It's still a productive conversation in a way. It's okay to be pissed about it. You're a sports fan. I mean, uh, uh, the analogy I made yesterday, Mike, we're old enough to remember the movie Caddyshack where the, the priest is out there. He's about to have his best round of his life and it's raining and thundering. He says, the good Lord would never ruin the best round of my life. And I think that's sort of the way Bruins fans feel. It's like, we're about to win the cup and the world's coming to an end. You know, come on, we're about to win the cup. And it's like, how could you worry about that when, you know, there's people suffering and it, you sort of feel like an a-hole for a second. But that, I mean, that's what we are. We're sports fans. So I think it's okay to, to feel that and express it and talk about it. Bruins were about to win the cup and the world came to an end. That sucks. Now, I, I said off the top that when I introduced both of you, talked about the range uh, that you have, whether it's lacrosse and, and hockey for you, uh, uh, Marissa, or whether it's uh, soccer for you, Michael, and, and football and hockey. Uh, during this time, uh, do you feel like you have something that the, uh, your audience doesn't know or you need to develop? something another uh, another mast a mastery of another sport or dive into another sport whether it's uh whether it's soccer whether it's rugby whether it's cricket something uh, that... you know, so we try mike a little bit i've tried you know uh i've taken an interest in heavyweight boxing recently i think that division's coming on so we watch it we talk about it i am kind of a soccer fan uh i really need u.s soccer though i'm, I'm not going to talk about you know british premier league and you know, that sort of stuff. So I, I need U.S. soccer to come on. So I, I, I root for MLS and the Rebs to become more relevant because I, I, I would sort of like that. The other, you know, faucet that we just don't turn on, but you also ask, how do we fill the time? At any point in time, if we wanted to go politics, current events, and just flip that switch and turn that faucet on, we'd have four hours a day, five days a week, right? If we just wanted to roll on Trump's press conference, and we, I mean, I don't know if you saw his press conference last night. I mean, just absolutely insane you know just these screaming matches with the media in the time of the national you know the world's coming to an end and he's screaming at reporters back and forth like it's a talk radio show if if we just wanted to play and i actually rolled on it and we might play it today you know because it's just so but if you wanted to if you wanted to just roll on that and play it four hours a day five days a week no problem you'd have a show it's just i find that kind of it's a little too easy you know, I think it's a little harder to find sport. people come to us for sports. So find those sports angles and try and mine those sports angles. But if it ever gets really dry or really slow, just turn on a press, uh, Trump press conference. I think you're all set. You know, we're going to get to, we're going to get to questions in about five minutes. I know uh, Michael's got to prepare for his show. So I, I, I want to start questions pretty uh, right on time at 1230. But uh, Marissa, you have mentioned the job market uh, a couple of times. Uh, the Herald made its changes. And I agree with Michael. Uh, it is just better when you've got a robust two newspaper town and there's competition. It makes everybody better. And I, I believe that the readers are served very well too. But Marissa, you can answer this question better than we can right now. What do you say? You're a com uh, graduate, 2017. Somebody coming behind you right now, what, recommend, re- what recommendation would you have for them getting into this business? Or would you steer them away from this business? Yeah, I'm not the type of person that ever tells people, oh, just don't do journalism, because there are a lot of people who I would go to for advice, and they're like, oh, just leave the field. And that's not productive. Like, if you want to do this, then you should try it. 
Um, the, the advice I always give people if there wasn't a pandemic is there's no shame in freelancing. Go around, sell your stories, go try to find stories. Um, if you might not care about high school swimming, but you might, there might be an interesting story there to tell. And there's, there's an audience for everything. So what I usually tell people is if you really want to do this, go find your own stories and try to sell them. And that will sell yourself, create your own networking. I mean, like for me right now, I don't have a job now. And I've gone back and I'm writing for a few places I used to freelance for because those connections are still there. So that's one of the most important things you can do no matter what. And even if you can't find a place to write right now, because it's very difficult to, it, it's still okay to network. It's still okay to try to find stories, try to find a platform for them. So that's the only thing I would tell people right now, because it, and it's much tougher than it usually is. So Mike, just first of all, I have another 10, 15 minutes, so I don't have to go right the second, but uh, okay, good, the, good. Uh, the, the way I, I, I've always answered that question, and for you, it's the same thing. It's like, it's so different uh, now than when we were coming up. When, when, when I graduated BUCOM in 1992, it was go write for a newspaper, go write for a magazine, or go intern at a TV or radio station, and that's it. There was no internet. There was no internet in 1992. I mean, it was, you know, there was no wide distribution of the internet. There, it, it, it wasn't a, a possibility. So unless Mike or I got an internship at Channel 5 or Channel 4 or EEI or wrote for the Herald or the Globe, there was nothing. There was nothing to do. Now, now you can on your own blog. Now you can on your own write, uh, podcast, all those things. And so even if you don't have a job, you can still do it. You, you can still practice the craft and get things published and get things on the web. And you can then present that to go actually get a job. So that like I, what I say, but it, it, I'm a fish out of water nowadays, Mike, cause it's, you know, we didn't have that Avenue, but now if you don't get a job at a traditional media place, go online and write, go online and podcast, go online and broadcast and build up a little portfolio and take it from there. That's an opportunity Mike and I didn't have when we started a million years ago. Yeah, uh, there, there are many examples of people who have done uh, just that. There's a uh, guy on ESPN right Bill now. Bill Simmons, Mike. Bill, Bill Simmons, Tom. Uh, you know, Tom Bradley. I mean, I mean, just let me jump in quickly. It was, it was, you know, in the 90s, I was still a glorified intern at the Herald. I'd been there for, I don't know, five, six years because they had uh, college internship programs through BU. And I sort of hung on in that role for years after. And Bill Simmons worked right next to me and Tony Maz. And Paul Perillo and some other guys that you might be familiar with now who are still in town, still working. And they would promote from within those ranks. And Tony got the first job, I remember. And I got one. And they didn't like Bill Simmons for some reason, if you can believe it. Like, talk about poor personnel uh, evaluation. But they didn't, for some reason, they didn't click with Bill Simmons. And so Bill Simmons said, screw this. I'm going to go 10 bar and write on something called the internet. Which at the time, I'm like, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. Like, what, what is that? And he just grew it from there. And I know like that's sort of the ultimate early success story, but that's what's available to kids now that wasn't available then. And he was really a trailblazer on that. He, he really was. And I, I remember too, because he, uh, he loved uh, some of the people at the Globe, he, you know, old school. He loved, you know, Lee Montville and, and Bob Ryan. So he, he was always his dream to work at the Globe too. And so when that didn't happen, I mean, he used to torture us too. He used to go online and just like, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. They're ridiculous. But look what he did. He was able to really just blaze a path, as Michael said, blaze a path that nobody else was thinking about and still doing great things today. Another guy I was going to mention, I works for ESPN right now. His name is Field Yates. So Field, I remember Field Yates used to work, uh, he used to work in the front office uh, for, for the Kansas City Chiefs. And, and the, uh, the head coach there, I, I'm, I'm not telling tales out of school. I'm sure he'll say this. Head coach at the time, Todd Haley, did not like him. Uh, it, Todd Haley thought he was a spy, Mike, for, for, uh, for Bill Belichick <laughs> and Bill. Scott Fiona. He thought he was a spy. <laughs> so like, get this New England guy out of here. I don't like him. I don't trust him. So he was out of the business, and he, I remember him coming to me and saying, you know, what should I do? What should I do? I, I, I've got the stuff that I've written about football. Uh, Peter King said, hey, why don't you, Peter King, a, a football insider, said, hey, why don't you write a couple of projects for me? Peter saw it. He said, well, this is pretty good. Eventually, I mean, probably within a few months, ESPN has given him a tryout, and now he's been on ESPN for the last five or six years. So there are many, there are many ways to get there. I'm going to ask you guys one more question, and then I'm going to turn it over to the, the Q&A. Uh, Michael, you mentioned it, so I want you to start it and then uh, give it back to Marissa. You said if you wanted to talk politics or, or world events or something like that, you could fill it up. Now, I know this is a, a dividing line for some people. Some sports people say, leave it alone. Some sports people say, if this is what is on your, your audience's mind, why not go with it? 
Uh, why did you make the decision just to kind of push away from it? Because this is why, Mike, I think that the, uh, the options to viewers and listeners are so many. You turn on, if you have satellite radio, there's, are there 200 channels on that thing? Uh, if you turn on terrestrial radio, there's another, whatever, 60 channels. If you turn on internet radio, there's a thousand channels. Okay. So if someone wants politics, they have a place to go for politics. If they want rock music, they have a place for rock music. If they want country music, there's a place for country music. And it's all fractured and it's all specialized. If you want local sports talk radio, live local sports talk radio, there's only one place to go. And that's local sports radio. Internet radio doesn't have live and local sports radio. They don't. They have national shows. They have podcasts, which are tape. Uh, you know, satellite has sports radio shows, but they're national. They're not Boston. So if you are one of the, whatever, six, eight million people who live in the Boston area and you're a New England Patriots fan and you turn on your radio Monday at two o'clock because you want to hear about the Patriots, we and EEI uh, and NBC Sports Boston, they're the only places to get it. Only places. You can't go anywhere else to get it. So I feel I should take advantage of that. Because if I come on on a Monday after a Patriots game and talk politics, it's like, well, the guy's got, the guy in his car's got 500 different options for politics and I don't do it the best. You know, and there's 500 people to compete with. That's too big of a pool. But when it comes to live local sports talk, local sports radio is the only place that does it. So I think anytime I'm not doing it, I'm sort of missing the boat because we're the only, cause, because we have a monopoly on it. Uh, and, and Marissa, I guess the question for you is, as a beat writer is, when somebody, when a player, let's say, you know, you, you weren't covering Tim Thomas, but like a Tim Thomas uh, type, somebody has something to say outside of, or, or Andrew Ference is another guy who's very uh, political. If they have something to say outside of the game, outside of the sport, uh, what is your, do you have a policy? Do you have a, an approach with what to do with that? Do you go ahead and, and report what they say? Or do you say, okay, that's, that's just not really what I do. I mean, to me, the job of the beat reporter is to report to news, right? So if a guy says something, you're reporting on that. I mean, my job was, wasn't in putting my opinion out there. Um, I could write columns if I wanted to, but that's not something I would ask to do most of the time. So if I was covering and Tim Thomas said something like off the wall or whatever, then I would just write, Tim Thomas said this today. And it's not my job to inflict an opinion on that. That's what we leave to the sports talk radio hosts or the columnists. So for me, I would just display the information, give access to the readers, and then they can cr come up with your own opinion from there. Um, my beat partner, when I was at the Herald, Steve Conroy, he might go in a direction of writing a more opinion-y column because that was more his job than mine. Um, but I, I kind of had that free pass of I don't have to really say anything about it. Uh, I, I think we should get to some questions here. There's some really good ones here as I'm looking through. Uh, uh, Felger, I'll start with one. Uh, somebody wants to know why you hate Brett Brown so much, you know, uh, local guy, BU guy. Why do you hate Brett Brown? Uh, I don't know. You ever watch him out of the timeout? The guy's clueless <laughs> when to call timeouts. How to, like, I feel like it actually got better this year. Oddly enough, the team went downhill, but I felt the team in some of those games against the Celtics had more of a clue. But I, I, I just think in some of those games the last couple of years, Stevens just coached circles around him, circles. So I, I, I think I'm one of the biggest frauds in pro sports is the process. I think Philly just sucked for year after year after year, and they hit on like one or two picks, like one and a half picks. But I don't think there was any process. I just think they sucked for so long, and Embiid's kind of okay. That's it. Uh, there's, there's the answer there. Uh, this is for, for both of you. Uh, Marissa, I'll start. You start with this one, and Mike, I want to hear your answer too. Uh, Max says, my fifth grader wants to know when you became interested – in sports journalism. When did you become interested in it? Um, when I was about 10, I knew I wanted to write and I started to get like very into sports. I was watching all the TV shows on at the time, CSN, NE, uh, Nesson, everything. I was just like very into it. I didn't really think about myself like connecting the dots of, oh, I could write about sports too until I started seeing Jackie McMullen on stuff. She was the first woman I ever saw covering sports and like having a platform. And it kind of connected the dots for me that like, oh, I, I could write about this if I wanted to. Like, if I wanted to take my opinions or my thoughts on the Bruins or the Red Sox, like, I'm able to do that too. And I started covering lacrosse when I was 14 for SB Nation and kind of just never stopped from there. How about you, so, Mike? Yeah, I'm lucky. I wanted to do it when I was a kid. I don't know if it was 10. You know, when I was 10, I wanted to be Robin Yount. Uh, but as soon as I realized I wasn't going to be uh, a Hall of Fame baseball player, which is by the time I was probably 12, uh, I, I knew I still wanted to be in it. And I, you know, I was just such a sports junkie. My family were sports junkies. And I, 
you know, for some reason as a kid, I read newspapers and I read the sports section and I loved the sports section. So I, I knew early on, Mike, when I was in high school, early on in high school, that I wanted to be a sports writer. I just, so I'm, I'm, lu I'm lucky that way. And I don't think a lot of kids have that advantage. You know, my, my 15 year old has no idea what she wants to do. I mean, that's tough. Like when I was 15, I wanted to be Howard Cosell. I know it. Yeah, and, and same thing. I wanted to do it from, from a very early age. Uh, and I was fortunate. I grew up in a, a neighborhood where there were a bunch of kids around to playing all sorts of, of games. So, you know, the Gavins were across the street. They had about six kids. The Leeds were two houses over. They had five kids, just kids all over the neighborhood. And so you're playing sports and, you know, you pick up sides. And I'm not saying I was the last one picked, but kind of close. Okay, <laughs> kind of close. So it's pretty obvious. Okay, that is not my skill set. But I always, I had a paper, I had multiple paper routes and that's how I would keep up with the news. I'd fold the papers, good old afternoon newspaper. I'd fold them and deliver them. Then I have the extras and I bring them home. I just really uh, loved the business and I always wanted to be in it. And so I would read the, the, the newspapers and try to compare what I thought about the game I watched and what, the, what these writers saw. And I just always wanted to, uh, always wanted to be involved in it. So. Uh, yeah, I just love the, I love the business then, still love it now. Uh, Brady Gardner, who is going to be in the business very soon, good sports journalism student, uh, JO514. Uh, Brady wants to know, when sports get going again, it feels like there could be a fantasy draft of all the current unemployed writers. Would this be good for the industry? Brady, I say yes. Uh, Marissa and Michael, what do you say? I think, it's, I think it's great for the industry if people come, if they want to hire them. Uh, there's tons of talent out there, like Marissa. But I just hope there's the... The app, you know, I just hope the papers are still alive and the websites are still alive and the media business is still alive. I mean, the, you know, cross media, they're, you know, everyone's taking cuts and these companies are in trouble. So the talent's there, the writers are there, the broadcasters are there. I hope the companies are there. Yeah, what's scary is I'm not sure a lot of people know, like the Herald, for instance, or some of these other papers, they were going to do this anyways. They're just doing it now because they kind of have an excuse where they can. Like, I've, I've, I've been worried about being laid off for months now. I've been worried about next season, about I've been trying to find, like, can I go somewhere else for next season because I don't know if this is going to happen. It just happening now is extremely bad timing because in a normal world, I'd be like, okay, let me just call my friends at The Athletic or I'll go talk to my friends at papers around a country where I've interviewed or talked to before. And I probably would be in some conversations right now. Uh, and a lot of other writers I know in that spot too, you look at the people who have been laid off from Sports Illustrated or some other papers around the country. And right now they're just not taking calls. So you'd hope that when this all ends, when that, whenever that might be, there will be some openings, but also there's just gonna be some places that don't hire again. Like if the Herald replaces me, I'd be really surprised at this point because at that point, why not just furlough or wait it out? Uh, and that goes for a lot of places too. So it, it's kind of scary because we don't know if there's going to be as many options as there were a couple of months ago. Yeah. You know, what you really want to see is people who value uh, what we do. I think Michael, uh, you, you said it perfectly. When you talk about local sports and, and being able to get that, to be being able to absorb that. I, I just, I, I'm just hopeful that places around the country will look at that and say, this is, this is good. We have an audience for this and we're gonna support it and not, and not just continue to slash. And you think in a city like Boston, I'm really disappointed, uh, frankly, in what the Herald is doing because I don't think it really serves the readership at all. Um, Megan has a very good question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start this with a guy who once said, get off the internet. I'm gonna, <laughs> that'd be Michael Felger. So Megan says, uh, what role do you believe social media plays in the sports landscape right now do you feel it has helped or hindered sports journalism during these times oh i think it's trash i mean uh i just think it's a, a big pissing match it's just people on there pissing on each other it feels like i you know the, the value i feel mike is and, and you know i'm not on it in unless uh you know tony will log me into his this page that he has on like a trade deadline day as a news service i i I see the value, right? I see your, you know, your stream. And if news breaks, that's where it is. And on like a news day, like a trade deadline day or a draft day where there's just this constant stream of news. Okay. You know, free agency day, this happened, this happened. I, I, I see the value there as a, a breaking news source. After that, I think it's just a bunch of people shitting on each other. And I, you know, I do that four hours a day on the radio. I don't need to do it in my pocket, you know, on my phone. I'm all, I'm all set. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Marissa, I, love I love Twitter. I love Twitter. 
Um, I, I definitely can see the problems with it. And there are a lot of just dumb arguments for no reason, but there's also a lot of tools to just kind of ignore that. As a news source, it is extremely valuable because like you said, you can find all the information as it's happening on the trade deadline. Like I'm just glued on Twitter all day. It's great. It's where I'm reporting. It's where I'm seeing what other people are reporting too. Um, it, I think it's important for um, young journalists right now too, to kind of build yourself up. Like I found a lot of opportunities just from being out there on Twitter and people recognizing me. Like when I meet a lot of people in the industry, they're like, oh yeah, I know you from Twitter. I like your tweets. Um, so I think it can be an important networking tool, but you have to use it right too. You can't just go on there and yell at people all day long. You have to use it um, for yourself and you have to use it to promote the work you're doing. Uh, now, now this is going to be uh, controversial. I'll say this uh, now, especially in the sports realm, there are a couple of news breakers uh, in, in the so-called big sports. So you have uh, Adrian Wojnarowski in the NBA. He breaks most of the news. Adam Schefter in the NFL breaks most of the news. And so there used to be some value, there really was some staying power of being that local news breaker. That would carry you for like three or four days. Well, a couple of things have changed that. One, the presence of these, these giants I just told you about. And the other thing is social media. Once a story breaks, nobody, like somebody, somebody might say, oh yeah, Schefter gave us this gift, but that lasts maybe like a minute or two. Now they're on to the analysis of it. Now they're on to making fun of it or debating it. And so uh, I always say, you, you want to be right. You don't necessarily want to be first. I think social media kind of pushes that for you. It, it forces you to slow down because there's really no payoff like it was back in the day in the Woodward and Bernstein. Uh, okay, it's not like that now. So social media does, that's the value of it. it yeah, but those information guys slow like, down a little bit. They still get paid. You know, Schefter and uh, Glazer and those guys make, you know, there's a big premium on those guys. They make a tremendous. But, but living. Mike, how many are how, you? How many of those guys do you have? You you have a, you had a handful of them. Well, they're national. And what's changed since you and I have been in the business is that local guys used to be able to break stuff. Now, yeah, right? if there's something big, these teams use it as currency Absolutely. to gain equity with national guys. And I, you know, I, I've I, I've heard an owner of the team actually say this to me. I'm not going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to ESPN because they're our business partner. And it's extremely tough to break yeah. stories local. I've done yes. it a couple of times. Like I had the David Backus trade. I had Matt Grizzlick signing a couple of years ago. And when you're a local person and you do that, what happens is the team comes to you and they start asking you, why do you have that? Why did you do that? You're not going to gain much trust from the team. They're going to be like, why are you doing that? We didn't give that to you. Um, there was an incident um, where I was, I think it was at the awards or something. And someone, because I had all the award winners one year, and someone came up to me and they're like, oh, are you going to do that again? Like yelling at me instead of being happy. They're like, oh, you had this information. So a lot of the times you try to break something. And I mean, it helps in the industry because people are like, oh, people trust you. You have sources. But um, you're completely right. The teams aren't happy about it. Yeah, I'd say, I'd still say keep reporting, though. Still keep reporting, even though they're not going to be happy for you, but keep doing it anyway. Um, uh, uh, one question, and somebody had this, we said it off the top, but I just want to repeat, uh, somebody wants to know, will this recording uh, be accessed after the webinar? Yes, it will. It's, it's being recorded right now. You'll be able to see it on the BU alumni website. Uh, John wants to know, um, I'm sorry, Sarah wants to know, uh, Felger, what proposed change in baseball would you like to see actually happen? Oh, like about six of them. Uh, I, I think that the no mom visits, good. Anything that speeds up the game, Mike, and tightens the product up. It, that product needs to be tightened up so badly. It's just, it's screaming for it. It's dying for it. So seven inning double headers, no mound visits. Uh, if the electronic strike zone is faster, do that. Uh, no extra innings in the regular season. You play 162 games and you're going to play a 14, 15 inning game that takes four and a half hours in May. That's absurd. Go to a home run derby, put a runner on second base, to start the 10th inning, whatever it takes, whatever it takes to tighten up the product, to get them to throw the ball, swing the bat, get in, get out and play the game. I'm in favor of, they're going to institute some of these things to get through this, you know, whatever abbreviated season they have. And hopefully they realize it's a better product with them. Uh, by, by the way, you guys have some great questions. I think we should do this again uh, somewhere else, somewhere soon. We got to do it. So many uh, outstanding questions. I, I do I have to it. run though, Mike. I am sorry, guys. I'm sorry that I have to run. I can't give you a full hour. Okay, all right. And so uh, I'll give you one, before, uh, one for the road, uh, Felger. Uh, Ed says, your honesty when discussing Tom Brady's future is refreshing. You repeatedly said his interpretation 
We will take any rumors unsubstantiated or substantiated and discuss them for hours, days on the show. Is that an accurate representation? Of course. Well, see, I mean, you know what people do uh, is if someone reports something that doesn't fit their opinion, their worldview, they call it fake news. Right. So, you know, the, 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 you know, the Patriots fans don't want to lose Tom Brady. And Jeff Darlington on ESPN comes out one day and says, guys, He's gone. I'd be shocked if he stays. We've got to come to grips with this. And we're like, oh, don't you fake news. Oh, ESPN, you're a bunch of bull. You know what? Like they all dump on Jeff Darlington just because they didn't like the news. Just because you don't like what's being reported doesn't mean it's fake news. It might be right. It might be wrong. But just automatically because you don't like it doesn't mean it's fake. So we go in the other direction. Anything that was reported on Brady, we took on face value and we said this is good reporting. And so instead of just <laughs> dumping on it everything, we accepted everything. And you know, when you do that, it's a heck of a lot more fun. It's a much better sports discussion when you just take everything at face value. And so, yes, that is what we did. And it turns out the Darlingtons of the world were right. And, and Michael, I know you got to go. Thanks so much. I appreciate okay. you hanging good out. Good luck, everybody. And I'm just going to add to uh, what Michael said on, uh, on, on Jeff Darling. It wasn't just Jeff Darlington. Uh, there were others who had some comments about Tom Brady leaving. And it was, they had it in October of, of 2019, September, October of 19, of, you know, reading the signs and saying, hey, Tom Brady put his house in the market for about $40 million. Uh, I don't think it's gone yet. Uh, he put his house on the market. Uh, he is no longer a, a Best Buddies ambassador He's, do, he's not doing things that he used to do. It appears that Tom Brady is going to, is going to leave. Now, I, I know that is not uh, two sources and run with it and with a blaring headline, but I think for the journalism students out there, this is information that you just kind of put in your pocket. It's, for, it's, it's interpretive journalism, it's context. And so all of these things do matter. As Michael said, sometimes you don't want to hear it, especially if you're a hardcore Patriots fan, but a Patriot fan, but that doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. Um, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Marissa, and it is uh, from Hannah. And Hannah uh, wants to know, I just had it here, Hannah, yeah, great question from Hannah. Oh, yeah. How do you think the media and fan attention on women's pro sports will suffer because of this pandemic? Or I'll just question, uh, I'll, I'll correct that question a little bit, Hannah, and say, do you think, open to it, uh, do you think uh, the fan attention and media attention on women's sports will affect, uh, will affect coverage of the pandemic? I'm actually really worried about that in general, just because you look at all, like MLB is going to come back and be fine, right? The NHL is going to come back and be fine. The NWHL is extremely lucky. They only had the Isabel Cup one game left to play a whole season. If that was midway through the season, I'd be really worried. But then you look at something like, so the XFL, they're not coming back, right? It, it seems like that's really scary for women's sports because you look at men's sports leagues uh, generate far more investment money. People put millions and a billionaire owns that league. Uh, I mean, the AAF isn't around anymore, but millions of dollars were put into that league and it failed. So you look at if this goes into the fall, let's say, and the NWHL season postponed. That league's do it's fine, it's stable enough, but it's not the NHL. So you do worry about if they aren't generating revenue and if it's not being covered and people aren't paying attention. Or when sports come back, if people are so excited about the NHL, they're not paying attention to the NWHL. You worry about all these things and about where women's sports will be or even women's pro athletes. Most of them have other jobs too. What happens if the whole pandemic affects their jobs? Can they continue playing pro hockey, pro lacrosse, pro softball, stuff like that? So that's definitely something I'm worried about long term is where women's pro sports, which have been really picking up steam the past probably five years or so, where are they going to be at the end of this? Uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Uh, uh, David, uh, David Tanklevsky, who's also uh, a com grad, uh, former uh, WEEI intern. Good to see you, David. You're working in the business today. Uh, he says, uh, when this is all over, what will the single biggest change to sports journalism be as a result of the coronavirus, and he says, thanks for doing this. Well, you're welcome. So, uh, Marissa, you want to take that? I have some thoughts on it. Do you want to uh, uh, take it first? Uh, one thing that I think is going to happen, because I think we were trending this way anyways for a lot of beat journalism jobs, I, I wonder about the travel aspect of it. So a place like the Herald um, owned other papers in St. Paul, Minnesota, in San Jose, and in L.A., and every time we had to travel there, it was kind of a fight of, no, I should go there. I'm the beat reporter. I know this team. You can't just take someone from a sister paper and they're going to have the same type of content. So now I think that after there, – there are so many excuses to cut budgets and cut stuff now. I think that we're going to see 
travel cut down dramatically at a lot of jobs. Um, even like one of my friends covers the devils and just because the devils had such a bad year, they cut down travel because they were bad and no one cared. Um, so now that you've had this period of time where people aren't on the road and, and they're still coming up with stories from home, presumably. Uh, and I think, you know what, so many people are going to be happy to have a job. I don't think they're going to fight about it all too much. Yeah, you know, and, and, and there's the tension uh, right there, isn't it, Marissa? Because I agree with you. I think travel will, is the obvious thing that uh, somebody in management or ownership will want to eliminate. But the tension, I, I believe, for a sports journalist is, I'm telling you, I know we were able to put this thing together, but it is better to be on the scene. I say that to students all the time. Like, there's so much technology now if you are covering, uh, if you're covering the state house, you're covering city government, I'd like, I could go right now, if I wanted to share my screen with you, I could go right now, you all know this, and I could look at uh, a Beacon Hill, what's happening at the state house, and there are meetings right there for me, I could look at it, and I could cover it, but there's something about being there that just, I, I don't know why it happens, it just affects you. you, you talk to somebody you didn't expect to talk to, you see something that triggers something else, and then the reporting just kind of turns on. So I think it's better to be there. So I would fight anybody who, who wants to cut travel. But David, I think another thing from, a, from a, a technique standpoint, now we've learned this. With no sports, we've learned that these athletes, we've, we've been in some of their homes. Uh, we have gone, we have talked with them, not about sports. So I think that has got to be incorporated into our coverage. I think the athletes want it. Now, I'm not talking about politics all the time. I'm not talking about controversial things. I'm just talking about a broader dimension of, of coverage. So if you're used to talking to Patrice Bergeron, Marissa, or, or Zidane O'Chara about two things, now you got two other things that you can bring in because now you know in this time away from sports, they got a lot more going on than maybe we gave them credit for. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I, I mean, one of those things being on the road too, like it could be a nothing game against the Blackhawks or whatever. And it, honestly, anyone reading a game story about that, they either watch the game if they care enough or they're going to look at a box score. The important of that is providing that extra context, talking to a guy, giving information and access they don't have and losing that would be such a huge blow. Uh, uh, Sherry, you can uh, uh, join me on this, please, Marissa. Uh, Sherry says to me, uh, do you have any favorite sports books other than the ones you wrote <laughs> to recommend while we're quarantined? Uh, thanks for doing this. Okay. You said other than the ones I wrote. All right, fine, fine. I, I won't recommend my own books. That, that would just be, that would be too much. But I think there are so many uh, good sports books out there. Somebody mentioned, uh, Marissa, you mentioned Jackie McMullen earlier. Uh, Jackie McMullen wrote one of the most uh, balanced books I've ever read. And I say that because it's very difficult. She wrote a book called When the Game Was Ours. So it was about the relationship between Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. You think about- That was the exact book I was gonna mention. Oh, what, what a great book. You know why? You're talking about two legacy franchises in the NBA. The Lakers, I believe, have 16 championships. The Celtics have 17. So they're, they're neck and neck. East Coast, West Coast, they don't like each other. They never have. And so if you're reading about Magic Johnson, you may want to read more about Magic than Larry. You read about Larry, you want to read more about Larry than Magic. But she just blended it so beautifully that if you're a hardcore Lakers fan, you enjoy the, the, the excerpts of the parts on Larry Bird and vice versa. I, I thought it was just really well edited, well written, uh, well reported. Uh, another great book, and this has been, um, this, is, this book has scared me. It has scared me into... Um, into inaction because uh, Dean, I'll tell you this, uh, I'm scheduled, I've been scheduled uh, for a couple of years to write a, a basketball book. And um, I'm, I'm about two years late uh, turning this manuscript in because I'm, I'm, I'm terrified of writing a basketball book because I love David Halberstam's breaks of the game so much that I'm just afraid to write anything because Halberstam was so great. And like, how could I write a basketball book when David Halberstam wrote Breaks of the Game? How could I do that? But so now I'm, I'm pushing through my fears during this pandemic. I'm actually gonna get this thing done by, by the summer. Uh, any other books? There's so many good ones. Um, there's a book on Joe DiMaggio. Uh, Richard Ben Kramer wrote it. Uh, it's called Joe DiMaggio, A Hero's Life. And uh, for those of you who haven't read that book, it was, 
I always say this uh, to, to uh, writing students, being a good reporter allows you to have a, a level of arrogance. Okay, what do I mean by that? You have put all the work in. You have put all the work in. You have, you have talked to dozens and dozens of people. You've got it cold. You know you got it. So it allows you to write with so much authority that if anybody ever says, how do you know that? You say, well, hey, here are my sources right here. Richard Ben Kramer wrote that book so hard, so emphatically, uh, that it, it, it's just, it was almost like reading a screenplay. I, I could see it was cinematic. It's really a great book. Joe DiMaggio, Hero's Life. And Marissa, you said sometimes people don't like what you report. Uh, when Joe DiMaggio was alive, he did not, uh, he was not a fan of, of Richard Ben Kramer's work because Kramer told it all. Yeah, it's usually what uh, scares people. Uh, that's right. Just, just good reporting. Good reporting. You're not taking sides. Um, a couple more questions before we uh, get you out of here. We'll try to get them all. Have you been following the pro sailing events and the shuffling of their events because of the crisis? I have not, uh, but maybe I should. I'm, I'm totally open to that, that there are many events that during this, I've been so used to covering maybe the obvious that I need to uh, I go, go a little bit deeper. How about you, Marissa? Have you spent this time looking at anything that didn't normally look at before? Yeah, I mean, some of the stories I'm working on right now is how pro beach volleyball is affected because they were going to have their first event in the United States coming up, and now they can't do that. Um, stories about, I'm trying to work on something about equestrian and how are people taking care of their horses right now. Um, I just did a story, one of my last stories for the Herald was on a rugby player from Franklin who had only been playing rugby for four months and made Team USA and now the Olympics are postponed. So I mean, there are so many stories if you look underneath the obvious of the major four sports and soccer and college sports, there's so many things out there. Um, one of the stories I'm working on right now, there's a synchronized uh, figure skating team from Lexington that's won the most world championships of any team in the world and they've had to postpone their world championship. So there's so, there's so much stuff out there right now. Uh, uh, Rebecca uh, wants to know, uh, and I think we'll I'll have this as the last question. You guys have been great, by the way. I just really want to thank you for, for participating in this. I hope you've uh, found it helpful. Uh, we'll do it again, too. We'll do it again. That's, that's my promise to you. We're going to do this thing. And uh, maybe we can do it live, <laughs> in person. Uh, Rebecca wants to know, do you think games can be played without fans? At what point does the NBA slash NHL have to cancel before it affects the next season? So do you think games can be played with, without fans and do they have to cancel this thing soon? Yeah, I'm not a medical expert, so it's tough to say. But for me, just like common sense says, if it's not safe for fans to be there, why is it safe for anyone to be there? Um, so that's kind of in my mindset. You hear about no fans. You see um, baseball, I think, in Korea right now has like these machine fans or whatever, mannequins in the stands. Um, <laughs> I don't know. To me, right. I, I think it's really strange. I, I can't imagine it, but we're living in such a different world right now. It's really tough to project and understand what's going to happen because like none of us know. There's no blueprint for this. So like honestly, my answer to all stuff like this right now is who's to say? Yeah, I think it's going to be difficult uh, to play games without uh, fans or, or even impossible. You think about it, there was a, the leaked report from Major League Baseball, which MLB uh, pretty quickly dismissed. But there was the suggestion that you would have all of these players going to Arizona and they would just be just off to themselves for four or five months. And, and, and the first thought I, have is, I had was, wow, are we that selfish? Are we, are, are we that desperate for sports? that we're asking people to do during a quarantine what we wouldn't do, which is be away from our families. Mm -hmm. So, hey, it's all about the business, right? You got to go away. Don't talk to your, don't talk to your wife. Don't talk to your children. Just be a, among other professional athletes for four or five months when we don't have a lot of answers. And let's hope that it all works out. Listen, you can have games without fans. What happens if Ruby Gobert happens again? What if one guy gets sick? You've exactly process, right? Uh, we really could talk about this all day. It's one o'clock. Uh, I tried to get to as many questions as I could. If you have good questions and you do, the next one. When we do the next one, uh, we will get to all of your all of your questions. So I'd like to thank uh, Michael Felger. He had to get going and prepare for his radio show, which starts at two o'clock. Uh, thank you, Marissa and Jimmy. Uh, thank you, Tracy Ricciardi. 
uh, Dean, uh, Dee Christina, and all of you uh, for joining us today. Have a good day.